Hello, everybody. Um, my, my name's uh, Graham. I'm the, the vicar of St. Stephen's we Westminster, and I had the um, the idea of um, of of having this um, just a just a brief um, discussion, really, about AI and faith. We, we something that we've been um, toying with in as a, as a community. And the person I I'm going to introduce in a minute just it has been um, it, it's been part of his own agenda, um, very very much um, um, something that which we, we've been thinking about in the community of St Stephen's Westminster. I I, I tasked um, our friend Lee um, Barnford, who some of you will know, um, to do this project, and sadly he's not able to be with us because. Um, he took himself into hospital after a course of antibiotics and they discovered that he had a clot on his lung. Please remember him in your prayers. Um, he is in good hands and um, he's having a procedure very, very soon. But he asked to be remembered to you all. I'm really, really sad that he's not going to be able to be with us. And he's been still <laughs> um, texting us and emailing us from his hospital bed. <laughs> Um, but I saw him yesterday and he was in really, really good spirits and looking much, much better than I've seen him look for, for some weeks. So please do remember Lee and uh, Kirsten, his, his wife. I'm going to um, begin uh, by a, a traditional English prayer from the prayer book. Um, and sorry about the light behind my head. I'm in my son's... <laughs> digs in uh, Oxford and it's the only light that he has in his room but there we are I'm going to start with a prayer and then hand you over to and introduce you to Matt so let us pray repent us O Lord in all our doings with thy most gracious favour and further us with thy continual help that in all our works begun, continued and ended in thee, we may glorify thy holy name. And finally, by thy mercy, obtain everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you very much. And that's the way of the introduction. I'm going to pass over to, to Matt, who's a, who's a vicar in, in North London and um, his claim to fame is that he married my previous curate and uh, Matt we, we we thank you ever so much for doing this we we um, appreciate your your wisdom on the subjects because it's something which is dear to you and I know you've had you've made some podcasts and we've had a, 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 a an event at St Stephen's in person ourselves but this is a unique opportunity to to be across the pond and to you know and to actually get you know do some really creative work so I'm just going to pass you over to to Matt Matt thank you ever so much for for being with us wonderful thank you Graham and and a very warm welcome to all of you uh to this uh, to this panel discussion I am definitely the least qualified person on the uh, on the 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 hosting this this call tonight um but uh, as graham said i'm a vicar in north london i've got a masters in computer science and mathematics and i've got a very uh, long standing interest both in artificial intelligence and in the christian faith and and the overlap Tonight is the first of two panel discussions entitled God and the Machine, Living the Great Commandment in the Age of Artificial Intelligence. We're going to explore these topics through the aid of a very rich and diverse group of expert speakers. And we're going to explore ideas around automation, control and optimization and ground all of this and the impact that AI is having or might have in our lives. So hopefully this will be empowering and informative for our, our uh, own lives, as well as being a, a good academic exercise as well. In a moment, I'm going to introduce our four panellists for this evening. Um, they're going to introduce themselves to say a few words about themselves for a couple of minutes. And then I'm going to ask each of them a question, a different question for each panellist. And after asking the panellists, I'm going to ask other panellists to maybe make a few comments to add to, to the what's been said. But once I've asked all four 
uh, of my questions, one to each panellist, we will then open it up to questions from, from all of you. So on the chat, please do post in the chat any questions as we go along. Uh, no question is too simple and given the quality of our panellists, I suspect no question is too complex either for them to offer at least uh, something on the on the topics. So um, do have a think as we go along as to any any supplementary questions you would like to ask. So our four panellists, um, our first panellist is the Reverend Dr. Catherine Pritchard, who is the project coordinator and research fellow for equipping Christian leadership in an age of science. That's on the Archbishop's Council's Faith and Public Life team at Lambeth Palace. So Catherine, perhaps you'd like to share a few words about yourself and what you're working on. Oh, you'll just need to unmute, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, and am I visible? I'm visible. Yes. Good, lovely. Yes, um, I'm actually, I've moved on from being the project coordinator. I'm now one of the co-directors of, of the new project. And I say that because our project coordinator does a vast, vast job that I would not even wish now to be, uh, to, to claim. Um, and I'm based, um, as you kindly said, um, both um, working with a team at Durham University, York University, and um, at Lambeth Palace. So it's an interesting combination of education and being aware of policy going on behind the background. Um, Matt, I'm sure you're probably one of the most expert people in the room. Don't be, don't be as modest as you were. I'm very much a generalist from a public theology background, but I've had, um, had to work in this area because it's so important. Um, and since 2016, um, as a project, we've been holding conferences and seminars for senior church leaders with leading figures from the world of AI, robotics and AI ethics eye-opening. I've noticed that a lot of our AI researchers and roboticists are very keen to focus away from hype about the role and impact of the sort of science and technology that they're involved in developing. And I think that's because, and I'm going to just say a few words about AI. Um, AI is used, the term is used in so many different ways. And I personally found it quite confusing when I started digging into the topic um, back in 2016. And I think for me, the most helpful way to look at it is as a family of activities, all with very different aspects. So sometimes um, what we're really talking about is an engineering task to try and solve a particular problem. So teaching machines to be able to perceive distance and depth in order to enable self-driving cars. Some people are trying to use the technology to discover the way the human mind works, the human thinking works, so to reverse engineer um, lessons. Um, some groups, including some prominent people in the world of big tech, have a commitment to developing a super intelligence, which is an ideological commitment, I would argue. So this means as Christians and church leaders and everybody basically needs to be informed as we seek to respond to AI. We need to be clear and informed. And I really appreciate the initiative that has brought this group together today. I hope that we will succeed in doing some of that. Brilliant. Catherine, thank you. That's great. And, and I very much resonate with the, the definition of AI and how there are a lot of, you know, terms that get thrown about and no doubt are good for marketing amongst other things. But uh, as, as a kind of perhaps a working definition, AI simply um, something that we might think that human intelligence is needed to do something, but it's something where we've been able to get a machine, a computer to do that. So something that that perhaps we think of as, as something needing a human, but actually a machine now can do it. Um, and there's a related term as well, machine learning. Uh, so that's where uh, rather than, if you like, giving the, the computer uh, a recipe, a simple kind of procedure to execute, we, we might give it uh, data and, and say, I want to do this, but I'm not quite sure. And, and the machine then kind of helps to fill in the blanks a little bit. So just to kind of get the ball rolling. That's brilliant. Thank you, Catherine. Robert, I'd like to introduce our next panellist, Dr. Robert Chapman Wood, Professor of Strategic Management at San Jose State University. Robert, welcome. Yes, I do teach at San Jose State in uh, uh, Silicon Valley, and my research focuses on how big businesses uh, and maybe governments get big systems to work well. Um, uh, I'm interested in explaining, for example, why Amazon, at least until recently, works so much better than the systems 
my university uses. And the reason that we found so far is that uh, uh, big systems work well when people work really carefully at getting them to work over long periods in 12 to 25 years is a very, is, is the, the systems, the, the, the periods in most of the systems that we've looked at. Um, this is relevant to AI because people's thinking about AI uh, tends to participate in a bias that says if something is new and shiny and it can do really cool little things on your computer, um, it's going to work well. Uh, and I think it's a good bet that AI is going to produce uh, a lot of scary half-baked things. And then it's already doing that. Um, uh, Matt mentioned to me going into uh, a, a, um, uh, his bank's um, uh, uh, chat and that doesn't recognize his voice. Well, the bank put that in probably because they thought it was really necessary for them to do that or, the, or somebody else would beat them to it. It's not necessarily make, saving them any money. It's quite possible that the, 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 the tech support that they have to put in on that is costing more than, the, um, than it would pay to have real human beings talk to you. So um, that's the kind of stuff that I try to, to think about. and. Um, uh, maybe even hope to avoid some stuff. I think it's fair to say that the great commandment calls us on us to do things well, and um, we're not always hitting that when we're doing AI. Very good. Thank you, Robert. Brilliant. Uh, our next panelist is Dr. Joseph Aylet Bullock, data scientist and researcher at the UN's Department of Peace Operations. Um, fascinating area of work Joseph and uh, and very very relevant timely in in today's world uh, we'd like to introduce something of yourself yeah thank you very much uh, and thank you for the invitation thank you to you Matt for moderating uh, Lee for coordinating and, and obviously Graham for pulling all this together with the idea uh, I think as you said it's a great idea we need to be having more of these conversations within churches and congregations um, as well so yeah as you mentioned I'm an data scientist and researcher in the United Nations Department of Peace Operations uh, I work in New York in the headquarters of the UN here uh, in a team focused on what we call information integrity which is really looking at um, misinformation, disinformation, malinformation, and hate speech. Um, those are definitely defined terms in different areas, um, but th those are sort of the areas that we look at. And I lead the technology uh, side of our team uh, in the department. The department, for those who don't know, oversees the 12 peacekeeping missions of the UN around the world. Uh, those are largely in post and current conflict situations. They are observing or maintaining peace agreements um, in some of the, the harshest conditions. Uh, there's about 90,000 people uh, who come under the department, which is a mixture of uh, civilians, uh, police components and military components that are donated by our member states to go into these different countries. And, and uh, myths and disinformation, malinformation, hate speech, really threatens the safety and security um, of our peacekeepers and as well as the ability for them to actually do their jobs. Um, and so obviously there's a huge tech element to this, there's a huge impact of AI um, on this that's ever growing um, in our mission areas as well. Um, and so in general, my focus is on uh, and previously has been on uh, also on in data science and AI in the UN system. This is uh, a job that I've taken on since February before this for about five years. Um, I was in the Secretary General's Innovation Lab, also leading the data science and AI team there. And so my focus is more broadly on developing and applying data science, AI methods uh, for data informed decision making, mainly in crisis response settings. Um, I'm a physicist by background, so I'm often also more interested in how we get to the answer rather than necessarily just the answer itself. Uh, and maybe picking up on what Robert and Catherine also touched upon. I mean, for me, I think the the design of these systems is really what's what's hugely important. Um, yes, the data that goes into it. Yes, how they're uh, built and the process they go through. But ultimately, there's a sort of wider design question um, that we also uh, try to consider very carefully within the UN. Uh, to your point on the human intelligence, you know, this is really essential to our work. We're not trying to automate anything or to fully automate anything. Uh, we have the, the the blessing of being surrounded by an, an, uh, in the UN by enormous uh, expertise in hugely niche areas, uh, political areas, 
um, or conflict areas or humanitarian considerations, you know, you have the huge expertise of the people. We're not trying to automate their decision making. We're trying to see how can we use these technologies to better inform their decisions and augment their decisions. And we we refer to things like participatory design, human centered design um, of these systems. Uh, I think in, in the sort of Christian language, we can also refer to this as compassionate design, uh, which we can get into a little bit later on. Um, so sadly, um, uh, like Robert was saying, we don't have 12 to 25 years always to design our systems. I wish we did. Hopefully we can get to that stage. Um, but ultimately, you know, taking this more compassionate design approach, we can hopefully get on the right track. So thank you very much. Looking forward to the panel. Brilliant, Joseph, thank you. And and some really important terms there of human centric design uh, and using AI as a as a tool to, to supplement and to to work with human beings in in important, important work and important tasks uh, in, in all areas of life. Excellent. Our fourth and final panelist tonight is Dr. Eve Poole, OBE and author of Robot Souls programming in humanity which uh, i can't help but think is a very very good title eve uh, would you like to say a few things about yourself thank you hello thank you very much to all of you for joining us this evening i know this will be fascinating i know it's the topic du jour but every time i have a conversation about ai i learn something new and i hope you will do too i'm a theologian by trade i've also got an mba and a phd in theology and capitalism so i try and sort of square those circles and one of the thing that, things that I've been frustrated by in my career is how often in the public square, when we're talking about these big issues, whether it's about economics or now uh, AI, uh, there is an empty chair where all the theologians ought to be. Um, and so at the moment, I'm really keen um, to try and figure out how we prime the churches to be able to feel equipped to be in these conversations, because it's really rather vital uh, that our contribution is heard. Um, I've written this book, Robot Souls. Um, it came out in August um, because, uh, a, a bit like Joseph, I'm obsessed with the design. I think if you're going to copy human intelligence, you need to try and do that properly. And the thing is, we've done it really badly and we've done it partially. Um, and that means we've designed something that no amount of regulation could really fix. Um, so my book is an attempt to explain that all the bits we left on the cutting room floor, because we thought they were kind of flaws in our own design or junk code, actually hold the secret and the magic um, and and are the, the essence of our humanity and the hallmarks of our souls. And that if we are trying to find out how you would design good AI, we need look no further than the fact that we were designed by God perfectly for his own ends. And there's probably some stuff in there that might be of use to the AI community, as well as being properties that we should be cherishing in our own humanity more than we currently do. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Eve. Wonderful. Those are then our four panelists tonight, and uh, and having read some of the the um, some of their their work, um, they really have got fascinating not only fascinating jobs and roles, but have got some fascinating things to to say and to bring to bear on these important topics. So, without further ado, I'm going to start by asking Catherine a question. Um, I'm then going to uh, invite uh, maybe one or two of our other panelists to to maybe offer a comment or two after Catherine has has spoken on the question and then I'm going to go through the other three panelists asking different questions and then open it out to you on the floor so do like I said in the introduction do uh, post in the chat if you can think of uh, if there's a question you would like uh, our panelists to to look at okay so Catherine um, you do a lot of work bringing together senior church leaders uh, together with cutting edge scientists to explore big questions, uh, opportunities, look at challenges from AI and other related technologies. So I want to ask in your opinion, what are some of the most pressing tasks for the church in relation to AI? What have we as the church kind of got to do <laughs> when it comes to AI? Well, thank you, Matt. What, a, what an interesting group of people. I'm just still reflecting on the panel. Um, I think we need to get back to brass tacks and getting back to a point you raised earlier, not be afraid to ask direct and simple questions because we can end up talking about a topic, not really understand quite what we're teasing out. So um, I think the first thing is to be clear and informed. 
about the current technology um, and who's doing what and why. And of course, I can't cover all that in this time. But I'll give you an example about being clear and informed. I was invited earlier this year onto a radio show to talk about whether chat GPT was going to replace religion, presumably because it could produce sermons. Now, the show was wanting to have a bit of fun, probably at the expense of the church, with the prospect of a super intelligence in our midst. Um, thankfully, um, somebody in the world of tech development helpfully explained to me that ChatGPT works in a similar way to predictive texting on your mobile phone. You have a choice of three words, don't you, in front of you when you're trying to text and you choose one, but it's a little bit similar with ChatGPT. It's predicting based on the sentence you provide what the most likely answer will be, and then it comes up with a whole bunch of sentences. And of course, I'm oversimplifying terribly. But in the end, what you're actually dealing with is a very large electronic spreadsheet. And also setting up kind of, you could argue, kind of feedback loop. You feed in language, it responds to your input. You feed in more, it responds to that. So we're not talking about a superintelligence. And I'm, I'm getting clear on this can help pop a number of balloons. And I think this is the sort of discussion can that can be well integrated into a talk in youth ministry or a sermon, get people to think about what is actually going on. Now, this feedback loop, um, the same applies in many ways to social media. And I know somebody else may be covering this, but I think it's a really important area when it comes to comparing social media with the community that is the church. This is another area where people need to be informed. And when you use Facebook, for instance, your likes and dislikes are collected and algorithms create a sort of digital fingerprint for you. So what you put in determines what comes back to you and the sorts of targeted advertising you get and your whole experience of Facebook, another feedback loop. So sometimes being part of a church where people don't respond to you with the ease of chat GPT or the targeted preferences of Facebook might seem less appealing. Um, but being known by other imperfect, embodied people is fundamental to our growth in love of neighbour and ourselves and God. Can we do all that online? Questions for us. Um, and then the final thing, conversation. We need more conversations about this. This is why I'm excited about today. I was at a meeting of Christian thought leaders about a month ago, people working in church ministry, youth work, education, academia and technology. And we did some brainstorming about some just some ideas about use, how to use tech. Um, was it a good idea to use a specially designed chatbot to help support a depleted youth ministry, perhaps a chance for socially shy teenagers to raise questions privately in a safe space? We had a long conversation, lots of thoughts about that, as you can imagine. Um, and we ended up putting some limits around the way we could use this type of technology as we reflected on the responsibility of Christian ministers the nature of Christian discipleship and ministry. And we realized we wanted and needed more conversations with this kind of angle, quite practical. It's a huge topic. The topic of AI and the church is a huge topic. I have literally skimmed the top of the top of the top by introducing some of these things. Most of us are immersed in the same culture that we're trying to get conscious of. We, we, we're not sort of sitting way back with a kind of superior grasp. I certainly am immersed in this culture. So now is time to be getting clear and conscious, helping one another to do that on the impact of tech and seeking to respond and use tech in a way that is congruent with the people, society and church we want to be and see. And we need to give thought too to the way we minister to a culture that is immersed in these sorts of technologies. Great, thank you so much, Catherine. Gosh, yeah, there is so many, so many elements to this, aren't there? And that's really helpful bringing out when it comes to the church, thinking about where the limits are of using this technology, uh, both online. I'm sure many of us have yeah, not in the distant uh, past at all thought thinking about COVID and how we moved everything online, and then we've, for many places, most things have returned to in person, but not everything, and. Uh, and there, there are advantages, perhaps, but also some real, some real kind of problems that can sometimes arise. Um, brilliant. OK, I wonder if uh, would any of our other panelists like to to kind of just offer one or two thoughts on what Catherine has said on that question of the pressing tasks for the church in relation to AI? Um. 
I think, Matt, if I may um, come in, I, I think what Catherine is beautifully pointing up in her example about youth ministry is that the churches and indeed all the faith traditions are experts at precisely the problem that AI community are trying to solve at the problem with, at the moment, which is this idea of, you know, we're losing control of AI. We, we've got problems with alignment. You, you know, AI is in its sort of teenage phase and everyone's having a panic about you know, is it going to sort of put its socks in the laundry or, or, or you know, come home? Um, and actually, if you think about what liturgy is all about, and if you think about what worship communities are all about, our, our day job is to try and keep people on track. It's to try and hold people to account. It's about formation. It's about the virtues. It's about all those things that are incredibly familiar to people, particularly in the Christian communities. And Matt, I don't know if this was what was said to you when you got your charge, but normally the bishop hands you a bit of paper and says, receive this cure of souls, which is yours and mine. Right. And if you think about it, that that's that's what you do every day. You cure souls. And in fact, that's what we're expert at, and that's what the AI community is really struggling with, because you've got a load of tech bros in their rooms programming these whizzy things um, who, who haven't had centuries of experience in human nature and, and what do you do with vulnerable teenagers and would it be safe to just let them loose on a chatbot? Uh, and that's why I'm worried about this empty chair, because I do think the experts need to get involved in all of these areas from the mundane to the, the more ridiculous, um, because actually I think we've got some smarts that we could offer. Yeah, that's really that's really good. And uh, and you you bring in there that thing of who is designing. In fact, both uh, both Robert and Joseph spoke about this, about the design phase, you know, and we've got to ask the question, who is designing and what interests perhaps are being brought to the fore? Um, I, I remember having a conversation once in a private school with a group of uh, young uh, teenagers talking about the AI being used to help do diagnoses in hospital. Uh, which which would be fantastic. And in theory, you wouldn't need to have a consultant there on the ground. The AI could do a lot of the, the groundwork, particularly, say, in a hospital where there aren't many specialist consultants. Um, but only, of course, if that system was deployed in the places where it's needed the most. Uh, and some of these uh, young students were saying, well, there's always been a disparity between hospital provision in the West compared to, uh, say, the global majority uh, places where there is perhaps greater need and yet lack of resource. So AI could perhaps further some of those those divisions, uh, which uh, which is something I want us to come on to in our next question, because our next question is for Robert. Um, because you're, you were saying in your introduction, Robert, you do a lot of work with, with innovation, helping businesses and large organisations to adapt to things uh, like climate change, like uh, AI. I wonder, and I might be wrong, and I'm, I'm very keen to get your, get your take on this, um, change can, can be problematic because sometimes you end up with the haves and the have-nots. Those who have been able to adapt, those who have been able to adopt, technology very quickly, uh, say a hospital that now has all this clever AI uh, consultant features that, that mean that they can provide diagnoses quicker. Um, but then those who have not, those who, who haven't uh, been able to get access to some of these new tools and, and uh, innovations are left behind. So I wonder what you think about that uh, and and is there a way to stop groups or communities from being left behind in the in the AI race? So yeah, I want to I, I want to answer that. Before I do, <clears throat> I want to say just one word uh, that's sort of a U.S. response to um, Catherine and Eve, and that is that uh, it's very important to understand in the AI movement there is a sort there is a, um, a, 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 a it participates in the deliberate um, desire of many American intellectuals to not listen to the church. Uh, we had a very interesting uh, development yesterday where the representatives of the effective altruism movement, who have been uh, uh, key to setting up the open AI um, um, process that has brought AI to a public notice, um, they fired the um, uh, CEO of open AI. Uh, and it'll take a couple of days to figure that out. But um, I, 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 um, 
Fei Fei Li of um, Stanford had written an article uh, saying that um, uh, AI is off track uh, and there may be more opening for the church to be listened to uh, since um, the process up to now has clearly um, uh, generated some very serious issues. Now, that said, I want to deal explicitly with Matt's question, which is, what's the likelihood that AI is going to worsen um, <clears throat> disparities that we've already got in the world? Um, and here, I'm going to be a little bit optimistic. Um, so far, uh, it appears that um, uh, the way AI is going to affect the economy is not going to be like the way that factory automation or the uh, mechanization of farm work affected the economy. Um, it's possible that uh, like cell phones, for example, um, AI can have economic benefits um, uh, both for the have-nots and the, the haves together. Um, it seems that AI affects the jobs of people um, who are paid to think uh, and so the kinds of jobs that AI can plausibly eliminate are, to a large extent, uh, white collar skilled work. There was a study that was um, quoted in the Atlantic magazine uh, that listed management analysts, lawyers, professors, that's me, um, um, teachers, judges, financial advisors, real estate brokers, loan officers, you get the idea. Um, uh, these are people who have a little tech savvy and quite possibly are going to be able to uh, move to new jobs. Um, uh, the other thing I want to say is, and this comes out of my research, it's also likely that we're overstating how fast things are going to change. It takes a long time from the creation of a technology um, that's exciting to getting it to something that will cause people to adopt it. And then people tend to adopt it before it's really ready to actually improve things. So um, uh, there's a long uh, gap here. Um, uh, in terms of job losses, it appears that the possible path is kind of like what we saw when word processing replaced typing. Um, there were lots of secretaries in the days when letters had to be typed. Um, uh, and nowadays, I don't know, in the United States, I don't know anybody who has a secretary. But there are a lot of people who have assistants and they're doing different work from what um, secretaries uh, uh, used to do. Um, but um, uh, they, uh, people who would have worked as secretaries don't seem to be having particularly difficult difficulty finding jobs. And I think lawyers whose specific work is replaced by artificial intelligence will move to something. We'll see what it is. Um, uh, and it's capable of spreading at modest cost, so maybe people without too much money, uh, but it does require some computer literacy. Cell phones are giving that to a lot of people in the developing countries um, that can, can participate. Um, we have a huge technology gap already, and um, AI is not going to make it go away. Um, uh, in Silicon Valley, we often talk about um, bad investments and bad products coming into existence because people have fear of missing out. There's something really shiny and they think, boy, I got to do something quick about that. Um, <clears throat> I think that this members of the Society of Ordained Scientists could learn to preach against that, that we need people that are going to take the time to produce systems that actually work. And that's absolutely something that um, the theologians can do and the, the secularists are having trouble with. That's brilliant, Robert. Thank you. And, and lovely to have, have you know, a, a note of, of hope and, and, and positivity, um, while also recognising, of course, you know, hype. <laughs> which uh, which we, we mentioned earlier, which is which is an important force when we think uh, think about these things. I wonder if any of the 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 panelists, whether whether Joseph, whether you would like to to bring anything in on that one, or uh, maybe Joseph then Eve to to just comment on on those thoughts. Yeah, thank you. No, really interesting and pertinent question. I think I was actually just thinking 
you know, I, I think the on the haves and have nots part of your question, you know, the the job component Robert's talked very, very well to. I think that's a hugely important part. And as and as Robert pointed out, maybe sometimes the the conversation is is skewed on that towards a certain assumption, but actually we should be challenging those assumptions. Um maybe to to broaden it though, I think there's also the haves and haves not at the sort of wider societal impact level. Um, this is both locally and globally. You know, you have differences in, in literacy and in technology, which again gives you uh, limitations on access to technology, but then often cascades into not being able to access certain benefits, particularly as let's say governments or other organizations become more digital. Um, you're at the risk of, of leaving some people behind. And also when you have decision-making tools um, that are trying to do decision-making with critical tasks, um, that may then also inadvertently um, affect those who are often, in, in the cases that I'm thinking of, those who are already most deprived. So what I'm wondering also, this is kind of a question, a thought, but a question also back to, to, to Catherine and to Eve maybe as well, is, you know, the church has always played um, this role of being in the community. And that's one of its major strengths, I think, as well, uh, building what Eve was saying in, in, earlier to her comment, which was, that you know it has this presence across society it has a presence at the local community level it brings together people of all ages sex races um and that is a huge benefit and you know in the in the un's context we've always worked with faith leaders as core partners uh, to help shape everything from programming to humanitarian response to everything that we do because of the role that that the churches and other faiths leaders play uh, in those communities so i'm wondering like how we can better have those conversations within churches like this but but other conversations at a local level where the churches can be utilized as a conduit both for the sort of theoretical how do we um better shape the ethical discussions the alignment discussions the things that you've touched on earlier but also how it can shape those practical discussions how can it help educate congregations how can it help have conversations around how we can use this better within our churches so that we don't leave people behind and that's you know that's a core tenant of sustainable development is leaving no one behind. And I think the church does that really well. And another thing that they can sort of bring to the table when considering these sort of have and have not conversations. So kind of also a question and reflection back to, to all the panelists really on that one. <laughs> that's right, no, that's good. Well, maybe Eva then, Catherine, if you'd like to, to bring something there as well, that'd be brilliant. Well, just to straddle um, both Robert's uh, remarks um, and also Joseph's, comments and, and a question that's come up in the chat. Um, I, I thought you might like to hear an example from the UK uh, of what's happening in the legal profession. I was running a brunch this week on AI for a load of lawyers and there's a firm called Denton's in the UK which is one of the large firms and they have already purchased um, a version of ChatGPT from Microsoft which um, is carefully managed for, um, for you know data security and client confidentiality and all that so that they can now do a sort of good, better, best pricing. So you can either have AI generated contracts, um, you know, which would be cheap as chips, and then you would have an AI generated contract that had been checked by a lawyer, which would be a middle price point, or you can have AI free, uh, genuine lawyers, um, and no AI at all. Um, and actually they're finding that that is already catching on and incredibly popular and that clients are also buying space in there version of chat gpt because it, it's safe um for them to do something similar in their own workplaces so the the conversation we had was that it's hollowing out so you know you go to law school you learn all these you know stuff that probably you could now get chat gpt to do for you and then where are the entry-level jobs because all of those years you used to use for training up to go on to greatness and be a partner will now all be done by AI. So, so, so what happens in terms of careers and all of that kind of thing? So, so there is, um, you know, poor me white collar workers um, question, but there's also the question in the chat about um, the, the terrible cost, not only environmentally, but in terms of um, I I incredible uh, and, and dreadful labor conditions for a whole load of people who are, coding images and all of that kind of stuff in, in warehousing all around the world. And it's a bit like what happened during COVID and the lockdowns where the rich people stayed at home and the poor people brought them things. Um, and that's what's happening with AI. People are panicking about the lawyers losing their jobs, but actually the whole thing is built on um, some pretty dodgy environmental practices and some extremely dodgy work practices around trying to get um, uh, you know, the basic recognition right in terms of data in at the at the other end. 
so I, I would agree with you, Steve, with your question, which is that we do need to the churches need to regard this as a social justice issue, as well as an environmental issue and everything else that no doubt we'll cover this evening. So thank you for that. That's really helpful. And just, just so that we're, we've all kind of got the background on that. So um, a big part of things like with Alexa, which you might have in your home or or other kind of uh, AI systems, there, there's often a need for human beings to, if you like, um, supervise some of the learning that these agents are doing. So they uh, some of the audio transcripts of devices or simple images or whatever it is that your device is trying to do might well get sent to somebody working on a very, very low paid wage, uh, if at all, to do very menial, basic uh, categorization tasks. Uh, you know, what is being said in this audio clip or what is this photo of in order to help the AI learn? Uh, in its in its initial kind of um, phases of training. So, uh, yeah, there's definitely a kind of a, a hidden cost there that um, thank thank you, Eve and Steve, for bringing bringing out. Catherine, before we move on to Joseph, Catherine, uh, would you like to add to? Uh... Yes. Oh, I'm loving this conversation. I, I think we should stay here all night and forget Strictly Come Dancing. <laughs> um, um... I'm thinking about some work that has already taken place and it, it involved a grant. It's part of the project that I work with. We provide grants for churches, local churches, small, large cathedrals to do things in their buildings which have a science theme. And one of the things we did, which was very, very effective, was we um, worked with Riding Lights, which for uh, Americans is a, a reason, a well-known Christian drama company, very thoughtful dramas, and they put together a drama about AI. And then around that, um, they would put the drama on at local churches and in, in cities and towns, and then there would be a panel discussion. So people could come and talk within those churches, use the drama to focus the discussion. And um, um, a very powerful thing to do, to talk about any type of science or technology in a church, because it starts to make connections for people. Oh. I can be in church and I can actually engage in an informed way with this. There isn't this huge divide. And um, and I would say, however you do it, get people in who know their onions, at least one person who knows their onions, and, and bring people in who can add that depth and gravitas. And I think you will get people coming into churches. Um, and the other thing I want to say about the Church of England, as opposed to the situation in the US, it's a big pull. If we do something, say, at Lambeth Palace or the House of Lords, it's a big pull because of the influence of the bishops in the House of Lords. And we are incredibly privileged. We may not have it forever. Yes. So we need to <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Thank you, Catherine. Brilliant. OK, we're going to we're going to move to to the third question. This one's for Joseph. Um, and we're going to we're going to shift a little bit. So we've we've been thinking about the church, um, thinking about innovation. Um, but I want to move to thinking about compassion and social media. Um, so I'm sure, you know, as, as we all know, there are some major conflicts taking place in the world at the moment. Uh, Russia and Ukraine, Israel and Gaza. Um, and at times I find myself glued to social media to see how these conflicts are developing and see if there's any way either myself or my church could help support those who are suffering. But I'm also aware of the way that social media can be manipulated, uh, weaponizing compassion, even sowing disinformation so that our behavior gets influenced. And, and indeed, I find myself sometimes thinking, gosh, well, you know, do I even know if, if this thing is really happening? And then the the human compassion there is dissipated because, you know, I doubt I doubt the facts, if you like. So I wonder, um, Joseph, um, how might AI help us avoid our behavior being optimized by governments or corporations uh, and limit the way AI can manipulate our actions? So if that if that makes sense, the word optimized there is is is, you know, a, a kind of a word meaning uh, in this context manipulation really you know to, to kind of get you know rather than our own interests being served governments or corporations interests get served instead um what do you think joseph thank you yeah and i and i think many of us suffer from the the challenge of being glued to these these social media streams um 
so no, and I think it's a very pertinent question because I also think that the landscape is is constantly shifting um, in this and, and becoming a lot more complex. So, I mean, as as is you've already kind of pointed out, social media does bring many benefits, brings many many challenges, um, and so this sort of applies also more broadly to to many other online media platforms that may or may not call themselves social media platforms. Um, it helps unite families, helps unite friends, it helps connect disparate communities in churches in particular. We saw the benefits of it connecting uh, people during COVID, and that has led to hopefully positive things, such as maybe we wouldn't be having these kind of Zoom sessions. Maybe people wouldn't have had the technical literacy uh, catalyzed to have that literacy if we hadn't had um, the, those platforms available to us during COVID to then have these kind of sessions. Um, and then also in, in crisis settings, in, in, in some of the crises you mentioned, as many other crises around the world, it helps give a voice to those who might otherwise not have a voice. And I think that's also something that we can uh, take away as a positive thing and, and reflect on as, as Christians and how to give those voices to people who might otherwise be voiceless. Um, but as you say, it also creates division, it creates anger. Um, it uh, has a huge uh, amount, an increasing amount of mis and disinformation uh, and hate speech. Uh, we know this is getting worse um, and we know it spikes massively during um, any kind of conflict. It could be a, between two countries, it could be within a country, it could be at the local level. All kinds of conflict in the broadest definition will spike some form of these kind of um, divisions, this anger, these debates, which is just uh, emphasized and <clears throat> excuse me, polarized by by social media, but but underlying that, it's it's also particularly the, the use of AI in these platforms. Um, and AI in this context also has it, its its pros and cons. It has its benefits and its challenges um, in these in these contexts. It powers uh, a huge amount of these social media platforms. The underlying algorithms, as you mentioned, to every platform really is based on some form of artificial intelligence. Um, it is also generating content on these platforms. That's a huge uh, challenge, sometimes positively, sometimes negatively. We talked about the likes of ChatGPT. Um, you know, you can use that to create if you wanted to, maybe not advisable your sermon, but also you could use it to um, so rapid amounts of, of hate speech against certain communities. You could ask it to just, you know, generate hundreds of thousands of posts and post them all over social media. You can flood those social media environments. Um, so that's a huge challenge. Uh, and the AI can also really enhance these echo chambers. Um, and underlying these platforms is, to some extent, in, in most cases, an extractive business model. You know, the phrase of if it's free, it's because you're the you're what's being paid, like your data is what's being paid, you yourself is what's being paid. Nothing is really free. Um, you're you're getting access to these platforms because your information is being extracted and your information is being mined often to then train these AI models. Um, some would say, I hope genuinely to try to enhance your experience on the platforms. Um, and maybe targeted advertising isn't always the worst thing. If you want to buy some new home furniture and you want you search for those new couches that you want, those new sofas that you want, maybe it gives you the best one that you want. You know, sometimes they can be good, but ultimately they can also have big, big challenges. And I think um, from the role of churches and congregations uh, and members of churches, how what can we do about this? You know, I think it depends on how you want to use social media. And I think the way in which you can use it and the way in which it, it can be used is becoming more and more sophisticated. When Facebook, one of the, obviously the biggest social media platforms that sort of was one of the first starters in this space, when that started, I think many of us went on it and connected with families and friends. Some of us maybe thought it wasn't going to catch on. Um, but then now we have a plethora of different platforms. They're getting more and more sophisticated. We're seeing also a lot of personality politics coming in um, as to who owns those platforms, where do they want to take it? We see the influence of individuals or the influence of small numbers of individuals who can really shape how society discusses different problems. And that has really huge consequences. So it's, it's becoming a lot more complex as to how to use and engage on these platforms. Um, and I think you know one way to do that is, as you pointed out, passively, you can get information from these platforms. Um, but as you say, the the way in which this information is being spread, what information is on there, isn't always true. Um, I think one of the biggest things we can do, and this is where the church can also play a role, is in this education, in this increasing of data literacy. How do we get more critical about what we see? Um, how do we critique any kind of article or post that we see? Who is it coming from? Uh, where's it origin story? What's the information underlying that? 
And that's a lot harder to do than just scrolling through your feed and just sort of absorbing the information. We've now got to apply an increasingly critical lens to what we see. Uh, and I think, as I say, the church can play a, a huge role in, in supporting all the different types of communities that we have in our churches to understand what that looks like at our local, our local level. I think also then on the left passive side, the engaging on social media side, I would also say maybe not everyone is called to engage on social media. I, for example, would not consider myself someone anymore um, who is called to engage on social media. I don't think I'm very good at it. Um, I don't feel the need to it. Actually, I'm somebody who's deleted almost every form of social media um, because I don't find it massively useful anymore in my life. Um, and I also spend my days looking and trying to dig up the worst that's on there um, in the work that I do. So I already get quite a lot of bad content anyway. I don't need any more in my life. Um, so I don't feel like I'm someone who's called to... To, to engage in it, but that, but there should be people who are, and there are many, many Christians who need to be in this space to advocate and to change the narrative and to create um, those safe spaces, those positive messaging, and those places where we can exude compassion, where we can show that there is a compassionate side of humanity, that we as Christians are together, united in that compassion for the causes that we care deeply about and that we feel that we're called to care about. Um, and so I think also the church should play a role in helping those people who do feel called to be, to engage on social media, to be advocates for what's right. Also, how can we support them? Um, and I think also being very strategic about that is how we have to be. I think, as I said, the, the landscape of social media is getting increasingly complex. We need to be more and more strategic as to how we engage on those platforms. Um, Many organizations, my department included, has what we call strategic communication sections now. We we look at how do we actually, we're not just communicating and putting out press releases and putting out tweets and Facebook posts about what we're doing. We're now being very, very strategic as to where we engage, how we engage because of that complexity. And I, again, I know the church at the national level is, and the national levels are having communications plans, but maybe we can have those things at a local level. It doesn't have to be a hugely long, complex document of what the, every single local individual parish church does. Um, but just like a broader sense of how engagement on social media aligns with the values um, of those churches, of those congregations, and of those people. Um, and then I'll, I'll close by saying, I think it's also at the global level and the local level, you mentioned these sort of global level politics, um, but also how do we as churches utilize social media increasingly to make sure that those local communities are engaged, not left behind, uh, and consider everything that we do. So I'm not sure I answered the question as to how AI can be used to optimize against what's happening. Um, I'm not sure it's, it, we've yet cracked that. I think um, there will be hopefully ways in the future in which it can be used in, 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 against the bad uses of it. Uh, but right now, I think it's really using that human compassion, being strategic, being critical, and being educated about how to use it and how to engage on social media that will help us um, as a, a wider church body to to move positively in these spaces fantastic that's great thank you joseph yeah yeah i think that's that's really good yeah i um you you remind me very much of uh thinking of if you like traditional media you know newspaper and you would believe what was printed because of the reputation of that that newspaper organization or all the specific journalist and perhaps uh, what you've highlighted there for me is certainly that that need to uh, to kind of know our source. You know, where's this come from? You know, do we trust this person if indeed it is a real person because of bots and, and other kind of, uh, you know, manipulations at, at work? That's really good. Would any of the panellists like to to offer a, a thought on that that social media dimension or something that Joseph said? It's definitely a, a kind of you know, a need to be strategic and critical that I think is a very, um, yeah, very important. Yeah. I suppose I, I would sort of share Joseph's worry in that um, there was some very interesting research done looking at um, campus mental health and tracking the take up of Facebook um, and noticing that there was a relationship between campus adoption of Facebook and a decline in mental health in that particular community. Um, there's a lot of research now out there um, about the effect that social media tends to have, particularly on teenage mental health and particularly on girls. Um, again, we're not particularly talking about that this evening, but it is another example of where the churches can really help because when you are 
in a situation where you can curate your community you can you can only see input from people that you want to see input from you know you're not living in the real world you're not dealing with people who aren't like you or you know people who might need your compassion and friendship you're you're self-selecting a gang you want to be part of for good or ill and and now that in the UK all the pubs have closed down, the churches are pretty much the only place that people meet across the spectrum, across the ages, across the backgrounds, across the socioeconomic um, criteria, all that. They're genuinely melting pots for all, all kinds of different people, and it's a very rare space these days. And I think the thing about AI is it's brilliant at things that are objective. It's brilliant at things that you can make a process, make efficient, one-size-fits-all it's really quite rubbish at the subjective um and, and actually religions are very good at the subjectivity of people because we believe in the dignity of the person and that every person is special and precious and every person needs individualized attention so there is something a call to arms really for the church communities to try and model inclusivity welcome you know spaces where people can feel that they can find meaning and acceptance because they're not going to find that online actually that's not the way the algorithms work um and those who are who end up being uh, addicted to being online do tend to develop really serious mental health problems and actually if we could get them to come to church and we could love them um they might find that there is some meaning and purpose in their lives which isn't dependent on how many likes and ticks they get uh, and that might be really revolutionary and really important practical things the churches could do mm. yes. thank you Eve. that's that's a, that's a good warning really isn't it the the way that these these algorithms are optimized to hold our attention you know we talk about an attention economy um uh, but but what is the what are the values if you like or what what is it that they're that they're hooking us on uh you know is it something that's good and edifying or is it something that that leads us downwards i'm going to move things to uh we're, we're almost hitting seven o'clock uh and we're going to move to our final question for eve um and then um we're gonna uh certainly if there's any more questions in the chat i'm sure if uh, if you're happy to stay on for a little bit longer uh we will we'll have some time for for your questions and in fact eve the question that um i've got for you very much connects to one that's in the chat uh that Gillian dare has asked um where she's been thinking about that what we we're talking about before about lawyers uh, asking the question, how is the moral and ethical consideration infused into AI systems? Um, and I think that's that's really pertinent. Um, you know, you, I might frame it slightly differently by talking about safeguards. You know, what safeguards should there be um, in new AI breakthroughs, uh, you know, self-driving vehicles or a new home care assistant? Um, or indeed in lawyers, you know, how do we, what do we need to safeguard in order to avoid losing something of our own souls or, or failing to safeguard for the future? I wonder. So important. And there's sort of two halves to this question, really, um, because there are roughly two categories of AI, if you like, um, uh, certainly as far as the European Union is, is concerned. They differentiate between something they call deterministic AI and something they call cognitive AI. So deterministic AI is the sort of thing where there are rules and you can switch it off. So actually, you do need to regulate it. You do need to make sure that, that you aren't putting in biased algorithms. You need to understand that you've put in the right kinds of rules to drive behavior. Uh, but ultimately, if it all goes wrong, um, you can switch it off. Um, you can certainly reprogram it. You can certainly audit it. Um, and a lot of the UK's current obsession with regulation is looking at that sort of system. So even the LLMs like ChatGPT, these large language models, are, are that sort of thing um, because they are just spotting predictive text patterns and there is a finite number of bits of data they've been fed and, um, you know, ultimately you can switch them all off. Um, so, so regulation there, and I will talk about ethics in particular in a minute, um, is complex but is, in my view, uh, fixable. Um, the problem actually for me is what in the UK has been called frontier AI, which was the topic of the recent Bletchley Safety Summit. And that is the sort of AI that is quite deliberately programmed to have what we might think is free will. So if, say, you want to build um, a Mars rover that could fix itself, if you'd stuck it on the planet, you couldn't reach 
then you need to program it to reprogram itself to fix itself if something goes wrong um and that's a bit like allowing it to suspend any any of its programming at all actually in order to reprogram itself at will to better meet its objectives and in those sorts of situations you need to be absolutely sure that the basic coding is right otherwise the thing is going to reprogram itself to do all kinds of crazy nonsense and this i guess is where the ethicists um and i guess the theologians but anyone who's got any philosophical training really need to get stuck in so if you think about it pretty much all ai is in private hands uh, in capitalist organizations that are driven by a capitalist narrative uh, fueled by utilitarianism which of course is about the greatest good for the greatest number and that is the sort of default logic it's not even considered ethics it's just to consider the business case and being normal and sensible but of course we would notice that that is a very particular ethic and it's not always the best ethic so as we discovered in the uk during covid um it seemed that the government in westminster was adopting uh, what they were calling a herd immunity strategy and the idea was that you would throw all the old grannies and people with pre-existing conditions and the disabled under a bus because then you would save all those kind of uh survival of the fittest types who would sort of lead us all to glory um and, and of course you could see why in public policy terms in terms of tax dollar that that might make sense but to any normal person we all just felt really sick and we thought that was disgusting we thought that's my granny you're throwing under a bus and you're sacrificing all of these valuable people because you can't see their value and that's not okay so that made us suddenly notice that these default public policy utilitarian calculus were problematic um, for, for very many of us, actually, not just uh, Christians. Um, and that's the problem we've got at the moment, is if you think about what happened with your own children, when they were very little, you, you did do rules because they didn't really understand very much else. You say, don't do that, stop that, sit down, you know, very basic kind of deontology in a kind of classic philosophical, ethical approach. As soon as they got a little bit smarter, you would start saying, oh, you won't get pocket money, Santa won't come, you know, all those kinds of things, which was about consequences. And that's where utilitarianism and other kinds of consequentialist ethics come in. Of course, the second you sent them off to school, you knew you couldn't be in the classroom with them, you couldn't be in the playground with them. So you then start worrying about virtue ethics because you want them to just be good, be fair, be kind, all those defaults, because you don't know the particularity of the situation they'll find themselves in. And that's sort of the journey we need to make with AI. We're still stuck on the rules and we can't possibly guess all the potential rules that they may need to have to come up with situations we can't even imagine, let alone envisage, given these things are designed to think better than we are. We are trying to stuff in a bit of consequentialism, but again, we can't possibly envisage all the potential uh, ups and downsides of these things. But what we might be able to do is figure out, is there a way to do a better job on virtue ethics? Because if you think about regulation, as I said at the beginning, if we just get this design completely wrong, and we design a master race of psychopaths who are optimized to do greatest good for the greatest number, Whose fault is that if it goes wrong? No amount of regulation can switch some of those things off if you put the deep learning in so they just relearn whenever they want to and, and reprogram at will. But if you have learned from our own programming about getting the rules as right as possible, we know because it's our industry about sin, we know about waywardness, we know we've never got it right, but we don't have to be bad and evil. We are actually perfectly designed by God and we should be using some of those smarts to think, well, what? What have we learned about ethics and what might we need to be thinking about in terms of understanding what an AI might need in terms of eth ethical scaffolding so that it makes fewer bad decisions? Um, and then, of course, we will also regulate, but then we might get those regulations slightly better. I'm just looking at the uh, <laughs> the, the questions here. Um, talking about the church in these things and not much mention about partnerships. Um, I think that's um, a really, really good point, because I think this is another area where the church is not only a bit too silent, in my view, but it's still being a bit too um, stuck in a little corner. And there are a huge number of organisations that the church is already working with and that could do with input from the churches, uh, where actually if we can feel braver by all of us tackling our own AI illiteracy, I mean, I have to say it was a massive learning curve for me to get up to speed in this space and there's a whole 10 pages of glossary in my book because I found it really hard to kind of wrestle with the jargon and not feel stupid but you know we are training these things up that's the reason they've released chat GPT so that we train it um, and actually if we're not training it then it's training itself on whatever's on the internet which is generally porn videos and cats um, and that's not reality and that's not we think what we think is special and precious so 
it does behove all of us to try and get stuck in um, to some of these models and try and help them be better, as well as get involved in all the debates that are going on about what proper regulation would look like and how might we contribute to that. Fantastic. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, lots of rich, uh, yeah, rich, rich thoughts and that and that kind of thing for the church to to kind of, if you like, um, to get involved, to not be afraid to to ask the, the the simple questions, to 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 um to to use the platforms we've got and the experience that we've accrued over millennia to to bring to bear on these uh what what will be of well what is already and will be increasingly uh, a very important area for for our societies going forward. Um I wonder Robert would you would you like to add anything to to this uh this uh, topic and, and what you've said? So the concern I'm very interested in um, the talk about social media. Um, the social media business is dominated by Facebook, which comes out of a very secularized part of Harvard. Um, and um, I've had some students who work there, uh, and I'm not optimistic about them solving their problems. Um, we used to be more religious in the United States than Europe was, but that's not true anymore. And I'm wondering, has have churches in Europe or um, religious people in Europe done any thinking about how to produce social media that would be more positive? Because we're not going to fix it in the United States. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah. What do you mean about solving the problems? Well, I think the, the argument is that um, social media tends to dis dissolve into um, groups um, pushing rather simplistic agendas. In the US, it's mostly a, a left agenda versus a right agenda uh, and does not result in the kind of talk that Eve is making that churches have a sophisticated way of, you know, and given us by God sophisticated ways to think about um, uh, people. And um, I was in a Chinese church last night and um, uh, very cool, wonderful. Nothing you ever see I, that, that social media would ever bring to you. So, so, um, uh, and, and I don't see certainly very most of my i don't i like like matt i'm not a big social media person but most of my social media contacts are among americans they're largely among uh christians but they don't bring power uh to the conversation that is lacking power and i'm wondering whether you guys in in, in england or other parts of the world have thought about what could be done about that? Because the problem of solving artificial intelligence is, it, it feels like a similar problem and one that we're just starting to deal with where the social media problem has been kicking around for um, 10 or 12 years now. It's a very good point, Robert. Yeah, the the uh, echo chambers that we surround ourselves in, it's something, Eve, you touched on with the church being a wonderful place where it can be intergenerational, it can be across uh, political divides even, which sometimes we, we do end up even within our churches, align ourselves to the left or the right. But but we need to break through that wall, as you say, Robert, from, from simplicity uh, to, to to people, you know, the full, full, full people that we are. Um, fantastic. I wonder, Catherine, do you want to add anything to what Eve has said before we... Um, uh, I'm going to kind of the, there's at least a couple of questions on the chat, um, which which we will look at um, and then we'll we'll come to a close shortly. Um, and uh, and I've got a prayer, actually, that uh, <laughs> uh, I didn't write. Um, one of those large language models has written uh, not chat GPT, but uh, but Llama 2, which has been developed by Meta. So uh, I really like this prayer, though. So I, I genuinely bring my own humanity to it uh and and uh, endorse it but um yeah catherine do you want to add anything to what eve was saying there and um, um 
yes, I'll, I'll, I'll be quick because I mean we've had such a rich conversation. We're all you know <laughs> absorbing a lot. Um, yes, I I just want to pick up on the question of the church's involvement. There are a lot of people. I, I might disagree, and it might be that Eve is talking about um, a different level of church involvement from what I am. Um, but in fact, I think AI has allowed, um, in a quiet way, has allowed the Church of England, for instance, to um, it's created a platform for um, bishops in the House of Lords to be on select committees, to be playing key roles in thinking through digital legislation. Um, the current Archbishop of York played a key role in, in developing one paper. The Bishop of Oxford is playing a very significant role behind the scenes. And um, I've been invited on a couple of occasions also to interfaith um, groups which are trying to um, expand the reach, the voices of, in this case, um, Muslim, Jewish, Church of England and, and theologians to make sure their voice. In fact, um, there was a meeting just before the, the big statement and we're having another meeting earlier on in December. Now, I think it, the, one of the problems is it, it goes on quite quietly and, and sometimes the influence is as part of a group or as part of a select committee. And it isn't, I mean, this happens a lot with the Church of England generally, and I know Eve will be aware of this. A lot of work goes on quietly. And then people go, why isn't the Church of England doing more? Well, actually, a lot <laughs> of people are doing things. You know, they're doing as much as they can. But I just wanted to sort of perhaps make that point. And it may be that Eve was talking about something slightly different. And the other thought very, very quickly, um, and Eve, I think, might have said this at an earlier point, this business of welcome and the counterculturalness of the cup of tea at the back of church. I'm wondering if we may end up in my wildest dreams with a whole kind of a fashion for old fashioned church, but precisely because people will be realizing how wonderful it is to be with other bodies in a room together um, where you don't have a great deal in common with them, but actually you're enjoying the cake and tea. And I, I don't know, but there's something there. And again, about liturgy and countercultural silence when you're not having stuff sold to you. There's so much the church can offer. And so I'm reflecting further on this conversation. Some lovely comments. Thank you. That's brilliant. Thank you, Catherine. Yeah, brilliant. Well, gosh, so many, um, so many threads that we've, we've discussed. Um, I, yeah, before kind of trying to summarize and, and end with that prayer, um, I just wonder if there's anything any of the panelists would like to say as a final kind of comment. Um, we've we've got we've got a question, uh, a few questions. Um, this one's interesting about the effective altruism uh, movement, which Robert you mentioned, being involved in tech. That's more of an ethics-driven organisation. Um, and I wonder, kind of, or, or the question is asking, how how can what can we learn from their approach? perhaps as the church being involved in business when it comes to, to AI and tech, uh, which I thought was a very, very uh, interesting question. Um, yeah, and and also how, how do we infuse that moral and ethical considerations into AI? I mean, that that's, that's a really key uh, kind of point really, isn't it? You know, bringing our human values, bringing Christian values, bringing uh, something to AI where, if the, the data fed in has got biases, uh, as indeed it, it does and, and will have, how do we kind of push against that so that what we end up creating systems that are better than we, perhaps better than we are, or, or certainly doesn't fall into the same pitfalls, perhaps, that we do? Um, maybe we'll take it, um, maybe um, Joseph, Eve, Robert and Catherine for, for final comments and remarks on those questions. Thank you. Yeah, a, a super interesting discussion. I think we could also keep going for a lot longer. Uh, and as you say, Catherine, absorbing a huge amount of information as well that everyone's saying. So um, I just want to say, I say thank you also to the other panelists and to you, Matt, uh, for curating this. Um, I guess parting words, one thing on the sort of responding to the challenges that we have, I think going back to East point on the, the cure of souls responsibility um, that, that the churches have, I think it's making sure that the churches are there for those people who are suffering, for those people who are finding it difficult, either in our local communities or in our global community that we're now connected to through social media. So that maybe means shifting 
um, or adjusting or adapting to this this environment and this digital environment and how do you do cure of souls um, on a digital platform and how do you understand and I think we're still grappling with this um, how do you understand how those harms from the digital world go into the physical world and then how can that physical world of the church um, and that spiritual world of the church be there for people so that's on the response side and then on the sort of on a positive note maybe uh, building on Catherine's uh, remarks just then. I think what the with the church also shouldn't be too hard on itself, and and in fact say, look, there's been a lot of really great engagements of the church in this space. Um, there's been a lot of really positive messaging. There's been a lot of really positive outcomes of how the church has engaged with the business side of things, with the ethics side of things, with uh, how they've engaged with um, with AI, with science, and, and it's only getting better. And so also I think it's worthwhile to do a stock take if this isn't already being done of the church to say, look, how has this actually worked well? What have we done better? We talk a lot about best practices and lessons learned in, in my my community. Um, is you know, maybe the church should go through this exercise and then communicate that and say, actually, look, we've done here's some great examples of how church, Christians yeah. and the church has succeeded. So I think there's a lot of positive examples that we can then learn from going forwards as well. That's great. Thank you, Joseph. Yeah. Yeah. Cure of souls digitally and uh, learning from our own experiences. Eve? So I think, yes, I was probably talking about church small C, not church big C, because uh, I'm aware of uh, particularly the excellent role of the Bishop of Oxford. But I think what we're up against is individual people going down rabbit holes with individual AI in their lives and the effect that has on individuals as well as communities. Um, and, and the fact that, that churches are in the heart of those communities and, and are best placed to help. So I, I, I do feel that that all of us in the pews need to get stuck in, as well as our wonderful leaders um, getting involved in, in conversations and policy about regulation, all those other kinds of things. And I guess that there are some lessons learned from effective altruism, which is a quite extraordinarily popular wheeze because it, it's very aligned with capitalism because it's all about utilitarianism and i guess you could say wesley i think it was wesley that said you know earn all you can save all you can give all you can or whatever it was um so it, it can sort of claim the odd theological bedfellow um but it is essentially you know get really rich and then choose a charity that you fancy and support it and we know that you know, philanthropists are not always a best place to, <laughs> to to help solve the world's problems. Um, but what why it's been so successful is is it, it feels like a kind of homegrown normal thing to do in capitalism because it is surfing a bit of logic within capitalism. And I guess one thing that we need to learn is how do we find the right language to explain what we're trying to do. So one of the things I'm finding quite fruitful is to talk about risk, because, of course, everyone at the moment is worried about the control problem, the alignment problem and you know managing the risk of these things. And of course, what we do is we're very worried about the risk to our souls of, of being bad. And that's the entire point of banding together in religious communities, as well as, of course, for worship and prayer and all of those other things, but to try and reduce the risk of us all going to hell, frankly. So there is something that we have learned about managing risk, particularly when you're talking about human intelligences, um, that I think would help um, because we can claim thousands of years of, of traditions and practices and disciplines around how do you try and trammel free will so that it tends to the good. Um, and that is something where I feel we we can absolutely play the AEA game um, because that's something that they want um, and we can help them with that. That's good. Thank you. Yeah. Risk management, sin management. Robert, Catherine. So I, I don't want to say, first of all, that I wish I could talk intelligently about um, um, uh, effective altruism movement. Um, uh, I've made a couple of efforts to try to read their stuff and haven't really got much out of it. But I think that they, they are, they're appealing, not because they're capitalists particularly, but because they are the, in some ways, the only secular philosophy that has anything that at all feels like a coherent theory of what you ought to be doing. Uh, and I think that the um, Sam Blank Blankman Freed was also affected by the Stanford version of effective altruism. Um, any other movement, if they had these two consecutive blow ups, it would really challenge them. But uh, I, I'm not persuaded that that's going to happen in the United States. Uh, I would say that the churches here, particularly the churches 
that are well connected in on major camp campuses have not developed the kind of um, ways of contributing to the conversation that it feels like you all have developed in England. And that's a big problem. Mm, thank you, Robert. Well, let me just say that when we had um, many people in the church were great fans of Barack Obama, um, but during his period, there was this sort of signing off on everything that the technology industry wanted to do. Um, and, and we haven't got a, um, a way of bringing to the fore alternative ways of thinking. Mm. Great, thank you, Robert. And very briefly, Catherine, before we pray and finish, thank you. I'll be very brief. Um, I think um, one of the things that is really interesting and fruitful is when we bring people who are actually doing the tech development. I'm thinking of a wonderful um, a woman who works in assistive robotics, who is trying to think about the community, how assistive, assistive robotics, telepresence robots, can both help um, access people having access long distance to elderly parents or indeed care workers, carers having access to people they need to care for, and how that can be achieved without also um, working against community care and people's commitments. And um, when she's, she's come to a number of our events and, she, and, and we've had such good conversations with her and she's really trying to think about that, that, that human centric approach to the work she's doing. That's just one example. So, so I mean, in, in many ways, once, once the, the kit is out, once the tech is out, it's a little bit late. We're having to do the regulation stuff. So if, 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 if we can work more with people who are at the de tech development stage, um, um, I think that's one way. And it's not an e I'm not saying this is an easy route, but that's one way that we can influence. That's great, Catherine. Yeah, befriend in your churches and other communities, befriend your local tech person. Uh, <laughs> brilliant guys thank you ever so much um thank you to our panelists to Catherine Robert Joseph and Eve thank you for all of you for your your comments and questions in the chat and for being present for this evening's event um the second of our panels will take place on Saturday the 2nd of December 6 6 o'clock GMT time 1 p.m eastern time 10 a.m pacific time and that's going to explore writing art and creativity uh so um if you've enjoyed tonight as i hope you have then please do join us uh again for that on the 2nd of december and uh, i'm going to hand over to graham but first i'm gonna i'm gonna say say a prayer and if you'd like to join in with amen please do this prayer was written by a large language model Lama 2. Dear God, we come before you with open hearts and minds seeking your guidance as we explore the impact of AI on our lives. We pray, O oh God, for wisdom and discernment as we navigate this rapidly changing world and for the courage to use technologies in ways that honours your will for us. May we always prioritize your values of love, compassion, and justice in our use of AI. And may we never lose sight of the humanity and dignity of all people. Amen. 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 Thank you um, so, so much, Matt. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, Catherine, Robert, uh, Joseph and Eve. And, uh, and, and thank you to, to Eve. Um, and thank you to Lee very, very much. And in his absence, we pre really, really appreciate all that he's done to collect. And hopefully he'll be with us on, on the second. Please do join us, like Matt said. And once again, thank you ever so much, everybody. And um, yep, go well. Have a good weekend. God bless.